Thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us today in uh, our uh, three-part webinar series. Uh, today is part one, and we are just overly delighted to have uh, Dr. Tom Deans with us. Uh, we've heard uh, Dr. Deans speak on various occasions here in Edmonton, and I was uh, a part of a session with Farm Credit Corporation a little while ago, and, and uh, my partners and I just enjoy uh, the message that Dr. Deans has to uh, share with, uh, with us. Uh, Tom is a uh, New York Times um, top 10 author of the book, Every Family's Business. Uh, he's sold, sold over a million copies, and the book remains uh, the best-selling family business book of all time. Uh, Tom has delivered more than a thousand keynote speeches in 26 countries, and uh, he will be talking about his family's uh, successful transitioning out of three public and private businesses. Uh, you may have also seen Tom on CBC or Business uh, BNN. Um, just a couple of logistic items. If you wanted to uh, send us a question or two, feel free to use the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Uh, note that all the questions are going to be asked anonymously. Uh, one of my partners is acting as a moderator and will be gathering the questions. We will get through as many of these questions uh, as we can later on in this webinar. And if we don't get to you, uh, be assured that we will get back to you. Uh, joining me today are, uh, as panelists are my two partners, uh, Richard Houl and Trevor Lukey. So they'll uh, ask a question or two later on in this presentation, and we look forward to their, uh, their input. Uh, I was mentioning this is a, a three-part series, and I'll give you more information about those next topics near the end of this webinar. Uh, we look forward to uh, having you join in all of these. Um, for those of you uh, that would like to pass this on, we are taping this conversation and uh, contact us for the link and you can pass this on to your friends and business colleagues and we look forward to talking to them as well. So feel free to send a link even while this conversation is going on, the more the merrier and uh, uh, the, that's, that's great. So Tom, I do wanna just jump right into this. Uh, tell me a little bit about why you wrote this book and uh, how are business transitions going today? Well, I, I, I think, uh, Bob, you know, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very passionate about my message. I lived in an extraordinary experience uh, operating a family business. Uh, and I, and I, I was a voracious reader while I was CEO of our, of our manufacturing company. And, and all of the books on the subject of transitioning a business all carried with it the kind of a traditional narrative that you define the success of a family business in generations. In other words, if you don't get the business into the hands of your kids, somehow you've failed. And as I kind of thought about my own family history, we, we had actually never done that. My great grandfather had a tire distribution business in the 1920s. My grandfather worked in that business. He didn't love it. It was sold. He inherited. He started a chemical manufacturing business in his garage in Montreal. And my father worked in that business and he didn't love that. That was sold as well. And, and so my father started a plastics company. That's the one I joined. And that's the one we sold together. And so you, so you can see from my family history over a hundred years uh, that we had lived something very different and I didn't feel like a failure. So I think to answer your question, anyone who writes a decent book is actually trying to convince themselves of an idea, not their, not their readers. And so I was really trying to make sense and convince myself that the decision taken by three previous generations to sell the business as opposed to transition it or give it for free to the next generation has actually been the key to our family's success over 100 years. It's not a message for everyone. I'd like to be very clear that this is just something that has worked very well for us. And it may work for some of the, some of the business owners and their family who may be listening to this webinar today. So Tom, I, I think your message is just not just for families. Um, I look through my client base and you look at um, our, our major corporations that have, have key employees coming up. Uh, this same message, and I've read your book three or four times already, I can't help but think that your key message works for all those key employees that might uh, strive to be part of that business. It's like they are family, but uh, we're obviously not talking about public corporations, but we're talking about key, key employees. Do you agree that your message works for other than just family business? Oh, absolutely. In fact, what I like to do uh, early on, and I'm glad you raised it, is to really define what I 
what I mean by family business. I mean, there could be a business owner right now who has no one working in their business who is related by blood or marriage. My definition is that person is running a family business because in the fullness of time when that business owner, I'm going to say the D word, dies, where do the shares go? In many cases, it's a, it's to a surviving spouse. And I got to tell you right now, Bob, I get more phone calls from elderly women, women, guys, statistically predeceased women. I get more phone calls from elderly women who have who, who's, whose business owner husbands have predeceased them. And you know what they tell me? They want to bring their husband back from the dead and kill them themselves. They are, they are stuck in the business that, that, they, that they don't understand or necessarily they don't maybe have the relationships with the key employees. They don't know the lenders. They may, but oftentimes they don't. And if you want to watch a business owner destroy value, not in months, but in weeks and in days, because of some unplanned health event. That's, that's what gets me up out of bed doing these, these types of public events because it's such an important message. We think that we can time our business succession plan like an oil change. Look, Bob, we don't know when bad things are gonna happen to good people. So part of my message is for business owners is get out in front of this issue. Start to talk to your family, talk to your key employees, talk to, strategic buyers, talk, talk to private equity. Precisely when you don't need to do this, this is when you should do it. That's called controlling the clock and that's good leadership. So John, you, you've been delivering this different message, a contrarian view of, uh, to business uh, owners over a decade. Um, are, is the message getting across or are we still missing the boat? I think it's such an uphill battle, Bob, because I know having been a business, I've been a second gen and I've been a founder. I'm a founder of my own business now. And, and I know how deeply we forge emotional connections to the things that we create and, and business founders are, are really stuck. They're emotionally stuck and I get it. I mean, I know it, I've lived it and I've watched it. I've, everything I described with my great grandfather, grandfather and father, I'm not diminishing how easy it was to let go of these businesses. I mean, it was incredibly difficult. In fact, I would argue it's the most difficult and vexing problem confronting a business owner. It's not how to make more money. It's actually, how do you do your last deal? How do you get out, right? And very few people want to talk about that. And then time marches on and we know that one of two things will happen. One, the business will have two, three, four really challenging years financially. And a business owner in their 60s or 70s or 80s, increasingly 90s, will just be so exhausted that they just give up and liquidate. Or they have a health event, as I talked about earlier. And then and then they're trying to do something very difficult, which is trying to transition while they're not well. And that is just heartbreaking. And so what I've been trying to do, Bob, is just flip the narrative and say, the sale, the sale to a family member, the sale to a, to a key employee or group of employees, that's not a public acknowledgement of failure. That is the high water mark of success for any business owner, doing their last deal and doing it consciously. Yeah, Tom, but, but, you know, the feelings of uh, weakness, losing control, um, maybe I don't see uh, future cash flows. It used to be all the family dynamics. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not the easiest thing to agree that, that, you know, I need to think of the end in mind and really go there. Um, it's hard. To, you have a saying in your book, and I believe it goes something like this. It, it says, uh, don't love your business to death. Uh, transition the love of this business to love of, of business. Um, and, and, you know, I can say that, and, and it's easy to say on a webinar like this, but it's hard to live that. Uh, it, it's really hard to detach from those things emotionally that we've created, right? And, uh, but, and part of what I try to do is remind business owners that don't be so hard on yourself. I mean, it is incredibly difficult to perpetuate businesses. Of the 100 largest firms in America in the year 1900, so this is the largest 100 firm, not a random selection of 100 firms in 1900, the biggest, the best in breed. 
Do you know how many were still in business four generations later, which is 100 years, in the year 2000? Take oh, a while. It's, it's 16. 16 of America's best in breed. There is so much wealth destruction in the modern economy. We, we spend scant amount of time thinking about it, understanding it, and predicting it. We focus and obsess on growth and making more. There is, this point is crucial. There is a moment in time where a business hits a kind of the peak of its enterprise value. And I say to business owner operators all the time, most owner operators are spending 98% of their time on their operations. They're getting out of bed. They're thinking how to add another product, add another distributor, increase their margins, improve their top line efficiency. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your ownership. I'd love to see owner operators spend 50% of their time on their ownership, protecting, thinking, planning, and executing those plans on how to harvest the wealth that they've built up in their business. You know, Tom, maybe, maybe business really only has a defined period of time that you're irrelevant. I even think about the accounting business and how much we're changing and the automation of posting of transactions and everything. You think ahead for 10 years from now, what the accounting business is going to be like is going to be very different. So maybe it's just purely impossible that, that these businesses will continue on. And that new blood, that brand new business idea, that brand new entrepreneurial spirit of the new owner is what really has to be that person that's going to take this to a new level. Absolutely. Creative destruction has always been alive and well in our economy, in our market economy. It is, it is the defining feature of, of, a, of a capitalist market-driven economy. The great Harvard economist Joseph Schumpeter in 1940 wrote a great book called Socialism, Capitalism, and Democracy. And in that book, he talks about, he's the first economist that connects the idea of creative destruction to mainstream economic thinking. And what he basically says is he's looking at that 100 list, that list of the 100 largest firms in America. And by 1940, all sorts of them have dropped off the list. And as an economist, he's trying to make sense of this. It may, I mean, they've got access to the best managers, they've got brands, they've got market share, they're monopolies and oligopolies, and yet they're failing. And as an economist, he's trying to square that circle. And finally, the penny drops and he realizes what's happened. The largest firms are failing to practice creative destruction on themselves and they wait too long and smaller, nimbler firms come along and change technologies, change business models, change the rules of the game, change the product mix, the pricing strategy, and those big firms fail. That is our story. That's our story. And it's a, and it's a rule and a principle and a core value of the market system, it never sleeps, this, this, this disruptive nature of our market. And when we as business owners get to a point in our age, in our lifespan, and we take our foot off the gas and we try to coast, right? We, I, I experience business owners all the time who say, I like the size of my business. I don't want to get any bigger. Really what they're saying is, I don't want to take any of my future profits and reinvest them in my business. I just like things the way they are. Well, listen, Good luck. Businesses get bigger. I know you know this because you look at lots of balance sheets. Businesses get bigger or they get smaller. Nothing stays the same. You can't even manage a balance sheet to be identical from one year to the next. Not even with malfeasance could you manufacture a balance sheet or an income statement to be exactly the same from one year to the next. What I'm describing is an organic, an organic view of business. And every business that is born, incorporated, will one day say it. It's really liberating. It will die. Yeah. Tom, in your book, you, you uh, describe uh, the what-if game. And I, I know you've, you've sold various businesses and you've lived transition. Um, is this one way to, to help others in your business, like the new shareholders or the new stockholders, understand uh, or, or build the passion, uh, understanding what, what if certain situations. Tell me more about the what if game. 
Yeah, I think the what if game is is really about uh, the next generation, whether they're family or key employees, when they've got skin in the game and they're asked no, when it's insisted that they're that they purchase those voting shares at full market value based on a third party valuation, not a kind of, uh, I think they're kind of worth this. But when they are asked to risk capital, that actually gives the next generation or key employees permission to change the business, right? They have authentic license, the ultimate license to pivot, change, innovate, drive change, not be reluctant and try to run a legacy business. There is no business on the planet that is operating the same as it was five years ago. In fact, I would argue that the change is coming faster and more profoundly to service companies, manufacturing, retail, whatever. It is an unrelenting process of change and adaption. So I just think that the way businesses are transitioning is as important as when they transition. And the risking of capital is at the center of my philosophy. So, um, so you're talking about ownership versus employment. And uh, so how do I uh, uh, select those employees or maybe it's a family member, but maybe it's that key person that uh, I'm willing to, uh, now I'm going back to my losing control and shit like that. Like I, I just, <laughs> you know, am I willing to give up some of my stock and give up some of those decision-making things? So talk to me a little bit about ownership versus employment. Well, I think, let me talk specifically about family businesses and then talk about other types of enterprises, but certainly in the world of family businesses, there are a lot of families who are in business together and there's no job descriptions, there's no performance reviews. In fact, the next generation are in there and they think that they're doing everything. And this is very common, particularly in farming operations, ag operations, where often uh, parents ultimately die and then the kids expect that farming operation for free because they believe that they have, ready for this? purchase the entire farm with something called sweat equity. Have you, have you, have you ever, can you find a definition of sweat equity in the tax? Act? Like, I, I, this is common. When we conflate employment income with ownership, dividend income, it is the number one mistake in family businesses. If we all just packed up and quit our jobs and went and worked for IBM, we wouldn't walk through that door thinking we own big blue. We're trading our time for money. But in a family business where we're often doing a lot of stuff that's beyond the traditional, I don't know, expectation of what you know is required, we're doing a lot of stuff. We think that we're actually buying it with our labor. And that is a big problem. What I would say with key employees, shifting the conversation and expanding it. Uh, similarly, there's a lot of employees who maybe expect uh, a discount or really favorable terms to purchase those businesses. There's a, you know, the friendliest deal on the planet is the business that we sell to our kids, right? It's usually at the lowest price and at the kindest terms. The next uh, gen except, except Tom, if, if I'm if I'm the other sibling that watches uh, Bob, the, uh, the 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 baby of the family, get a preferential treatment, this isn't going to go very well. It sure isn't. Yeah, when we when we offer the family discount, you know how that goes, right? Yeah, the child outside the business knows, right? That's where the family money is. It's in the retained earnings of the, of the family business. So they look at their brother or sister who's in the business, looks like they've got a jump on the real money. Listen, the courts in Alberta, the courts across the country are absolutely jam full of families fighting over businesses where there was no succession plan, no will, we're going to get into this in, in future episodes, but 50% of all business owners, including, I would argue, half the people who watch this webinar, do not have a will. It is a train wreck, it is a train wreck waiting to happen. So these conversations um, to, to move from employment to being a stockholder, um, how do you get these going? And, and it's, it's not that easy to start this conversation or is your experience that, that you can get there in one conversation or does this take years or I've got my own view about this, but I'd like to hear uh, your point. 
Well, listen, I'm 58 years old. I've been to 53 consecutive family meetings with our advisors present. And so that's, it was in the, it was in the confines of our family meetings where we were looking at the transition of all of our assets, cottages, businesses, art, all, I mean, all the things that generations of our family have accumulated through their hard work and efforts, right? We didn't just leave that to chance. We discussed it. And, and in those family meetings, we were asking everyone questions about whether or not they wanted to risk capital to purchase these various assets. I'm talking about assets are, that are hard to divide, right? It's very difficult to divide a, a two bedroom cottage or a cabin amongst four children who also have four children. Do the math, how are you gonna jam like 16, 18, 20 people into a two bedroom cottage? Like we know this. Similarly with businesses, businesses, do not divide easily. Cash, cash is easy to divide. So we're constantly in our family meetings trying to create liquidity, trying to figure out who wants to risk their capital to buy these businesses. And if the answer comes back, no one, then we take the business to market. We liquidate it and we transition wealth. We've done it four times. So that's your contrarian message, correct? Yeah, that's that. That's it, and that's a very difficult message for a lot of next gens who might be listening right now, going, "Oh my, oh my God! I hope my parents aren't watching." Right? I, apparently, I was. I got to buy this thing at full market value. But listen very carefully, Bob, to what I'm saying. In our family meeting, we would give at a relatively young age. We give our children access to family money. In other words. We don't wait to die at 85 and then just open up the floodgates and then all the money transitions when to our children who are now in their 60s and don't need it. We actually start to transition relatively small amounts of money quite infrequently when our children turn 18. And we coach that wealth transfer, we watch it, we measure it, and it shapes our future giving decisions. But we also then ask that next generation if they wanna return that money in exchange for shares. And guess what? We don't. Our kids have, our, I have two kids, 28 and 26. We're in the position and right now we're transitioning cash to them. And we're asking them now if they wanna buy my company and guess what they've said? <laughs> nope, nope, they've got their own ideas, Bob. They've got their own ideas, they're entrepreneurial. And I think one of the greatest gifts that we can give our children is the freedom and the flexibility and the cash to go off and be the entrepreneurs that they're meant to be. It's a very different idea of legacy. Um, I, I, I heard you say a little while ago, um, you know, as business owners, we typically uh, plow all of our profits, all of our, our, our earnings back into the business. And one of your points in your book, I think is a very strong point, it, it, but it's difficult for me to understand as a business owner, like how do you do anything but invest in one share and that is the share of the family business or the business that you own. You really don't have a lot of choice, but to either grow the business, you don't want to be beholden to the banker forever. So yes, it is your own retained earnings, it is your own profits you keep plowing back in. Now you think of some, some industries, like the ag industry, for example, like it, it is just brutal uh, to, to basically live uh, on very meager uh, amounts of money and then die very, very rich. And it's, it's just a huge problem. And there, there are many other businesses just like that. So it, it, Absolutely. It, uh, it's not an easiest thing to do uh, to create this liquidity either. So um, we have to be realistic in this conversation and just um, sympathize with those that are watching. Yeah, I, I, you know, but I would add that, you know, take that ag, ag operation. I mean, we often think that transition has to be this all or nothing. One day someone's got to cough up three and a half million or $15 million and purchase, you know, the majority of their parents' shares. Really what I talk about, you know, in my book and my own personal experience, I was actually buying shares, Bob, in my father's business seven years before I joined as an employee. Now, why did I do that? Because he was coming to our family meeting, talking about the performance of the family business and gave us an opportunity to invest. And I, and I did that for five consecutive years. And then he put me on the board of directors. And then two years later, he hired me as CEO. So think of it. I was a shareholder first, buying shares at full market value based on a proper valuation. Then I was a, a director. Then I was an employee. 
We do it all backwards. We do it all backwards. But I can tell you that when I'm stepping into that family business as CEO at the tender age of 37, I know full well that this is not going to be the Tom Dean's legacy project. All I got to do is kind of mail it in. I don't know, for 20 years till our kids are old enough and I can do the same thing with our kids and transition and even the unborn will be plastic manufacturers. Like that is not the way we think. <laughs> like, and listen, there's a shoe company in Canada right now where the unborn will be making shoes, I guarantee you, right? We know who that is. That is, no, we are the antithesis of that. I'm stepping into that family business and my job is to grow the value of that business. My job is to either continue to risk capital to buy that, that business and acquire definitive voting control, or it's my job to work with my father to sell that business at the best price to someone else. But we, we're either buying or we're selling. We don't hold. Yeah, so I just want to remind uh, viewers that if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, my partner Trevor will be monitoring the Q&A and uh, we will have time for questions and answers uh, near the end of this presentation. Uh, Tom, I want to go to uh, family dynamics and just a really short personal story. My dad, uh, my dad was 50 when I was born. He was an immigrant. Uh, he ran a dairy farm. And uh, I, I remember the day that he walked in at a breakfast. I was 13 and he announced we're selling the dairy. And I was devastated. Like, I didn't really know what that meant, uh, but it, it did mean that my dad and I would never be in business together, which I kind of gathered, but I still swear that uh, if he and I were closer in, in age, we would have taken on the world and we would have uh, done some pretty amazing things. However, that that message at breakfast was, was devastating. Never, never, and not only, then all the bulk fuel that, that fueled my car that I could just burn unlimited amount of fuel, everything changed. He turned off the, the cash tap, Tom was turned off. So the entire family just changed and, and it was his plan. He, he did what was best for the family. Um, the family dynamics piece is very, very hard to manage. I'm the youngest by eight years. My brother's 10 years, and I have another sister 12 years older. So, you know, I finally did end up buying the, the farm at fair value at the end of the day. But managing this whole family dynamics thing, tell me more about how to do that. And what is your experience? How do you get um, the message to all of the family members, not just the chosen one, let's say, the chosen one? It may, you know, and it may be, for that person, may not be necessarily feeling that they were chosen. Yeah, I've made a couple of references to family meetings, and, and that's really the forum to do it. I mean, one of the great benefits of a family meeting with advisors present is that everyone hears the same thing at the same time, right? So there isn't this kind of uh, revisionist history where someone, after a parent dies, someone says, uh, well, hey, uh, hey, sis, uh, I know you think dad promised you the boat, but listen, we were all in the family meeting. We all heard the same thing. We all know that the executor is going to sell that boat and we're going to divide the cash. Like the benefit of a, of a, of a family meeting is this open, structured, transparent conversation where there is just logic and calmness and good guidance and good governance. I mean, the, do you see what I'm describing? The family business, it's not the farm over there or that manufacturing you know, building with your name on it. The family business is the business of family, where family come and say, listen, through our hard work and energy and good fortune, we've been able to create surplus capital that will outlive us, and we, we're going to transition it. We want to transition it based on a full and open conversation, and we want to make sure that you're prepared for it. Wow. Do you know what? Those meetings are taking place, and I know you're having them with some of your clients, right? But what do we read about? All we read about is, is the train wrecks, the families that lawyer up and fight in open court and air family secrets and stories. The worst of family is always on display because it makes for such cheap entertainment. We often get the families that we fear, not the ones that we design. And I just, I just, I'm so passionate about bringing this message 
to like-minded advisors who want to do their best work. And the best work that they can do, certainly from a tax or planning perspective, is when we have multiple generations in the same room. The work that I know that the work that you can do and the solutions that you can offer families when you've got both generations or three generations in one room, you, I know you can do your best work. And Tom, there is a question that, that did come up and I'm going to ask it. You know, I think it fits in here really well. So what's the best way to introduce young adults to the education surrounding wealth transition? And, and how did you and your family um, actually do that and what? I know that you mentioned that you were very young at your first meetings, but did that involve, do you have other family members? Yeah, I have an older brother uh, he, who also, uh, I mean, we always attended those meetings. Huh? And I can't tell you the exact moment that we stopped walking around the room or playing or not paying attention, but at some point we pulled up a chair, we grabbed a piece of paper and a pen, and we really started to try to understand and get engaged in those family meetings. Uh, and now fast forward, I'm a speaker, I'm traveling the world, I'm a speaking resource inside these family meetings. I did a family meeting uh, just before this pandemic broke out in Chicago, a Canadian family that meets in, in, in Chicago. 17 family members in that room, three generations. Bob, guess who was chairing the meeting that day? It was a 13 year old girl. Well. Wow. Yeah. They rotate the chair. Now, when I say chairing the meeting, she had an agenda that they'd worked on with her grandparents and her parents. There, people think there's a magic age that you, know, you can start to invite children and have the money conversation. Well, the reality is, and I often, I often hear that magic age is 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. It's, it's never 26. 33, 37, or 41, it's always, it's always increments of five. And you know, and I know, same like business owners, right? When you're selling your business, five years, I come back next year, not four, it's always five. <laughs> so you just keep kicking the can down the road. You'll never, there'll never be a perfect time for your children to be ready for the money conversation. I say to everyone listening, start now, start. And people will, will immediately be thinking right now, well, if I invited our children and started talking about money, I mean, these are, these are confidential conversations. I can tell you to this day, we spend the first 10, 15 minutes of our family meeting reviewing our family mission statement and the importance of confidentiality. We know when we walk into that room, we are attending something incredibly special, unique, and, it's, and there are rules. It's an institution. And, and we, we value it and we work on it. And so we know what happens in that room stays in that room. It's, a, it's part of our values. Is it uh, a direct family or uh, in-laws as well? How do you handle that? Tom? Yeah, so my advice to people who are setting out or are, are intrigued by this concept would be to start small, so nuclear. I always say before your family goes nuclear, start nuclear. Start with blood, right? Start with your, your parents and children, but as quickly as you can expand out to include um, your children's spouses, please do so because their exclusion from family meetings is a, is a very loud statement. There's a lack of trust. And running right. parallel to estate laws, of course, are the Family Law Act, which gives spouses entitlements. And if you have concerns about talking about money issues with spouses in the room, my advice is find a way to get over it because just because you don't want to do it doesn't make your concerns go away. If you've got concerns about addictions or spending habits, I mean, that's what great advisors like yourself are for. That, that, those are where trusts are used, right? And we're going to get into these in future episodes in more granular detail, but that is what family meetings uncover, right? It's those solutions. I know the, the title of your book is Every Family's Business, and it goes on that you've got 12 common sense questions to protect your wealth. And uh, by the way, everybody watching, if you don't have a copy of the book, we will get you a copy of the book. Just contact us for a copy of the book. So tell me a little bit about the 12 questions, um, and how do you start this off? Tell me about the ordering. The more that I get into this book and, the, and more times I've read it, 
I, I'm starting to understand a bit more of the ordering and and what you're trying to accomplish. But tell me about maybe your favorite questions um, and, and which ones, and why do you start off with the first one as you do? Yeah, well, you're right. The order of the 12 questions uh, is really important. And I should remind people listening is that most of these 12 questions require yes and no answers. There's a few that require a, a little longer answers, but, but that's what makes them so interesting and also so difficult, right? There's no room for equivocation. You can't dance around the answer and say, maybe. Maybe is not an answer. It's, so yes or no, a lot of yes or no answers to these questions. But my, my, actually, my, let, let me talk about the first couple of questions because that really dives into the heart of the philosophy and the approach that has helped to literally thousands of business owners find their exit without lawyers and litigation. The very first question goes to really everyone right? It would go to everyone in the room. So for example, let's take a, a you, we have a business owner and he's sitting down with a key employee uh, at, to explore whether or not they want to buy the business. Question number one is very straightforward. It asks the person, what does the business look like in five years? Now, Bob, if you have a key employee who answers that question like this, oh, I don't know. I think, um, hmm. I think the business will be kind of uh, bigger and stuff. Yeah, do not proceed to question number two. <laughs> <laughs> question number two is, well, you'll, you'll hold us on that one. <laughs> yeah, that is, not the, that is not the response of an owner. Do you know what a potential owner would say? What's the business look like in five years? You're asking me seriously, you want an honest answer? I would discontinue this product line. I would sell more of this product. We need a bigger online presence. We should fire this person, hire this one, rebrand, buy this technology, license this tech. That is owners are forward looking. They are driven. They've got their own ideas. They've got energy. They've got passion. And it's that one simple question will tell you whether or not you've got a buyer in the house, potentially or not. There is no right or wrong answer. All there is is clarity. If you have no key employees who offer up the kind of answer I just described, and no family member who offers up that kind of passion and aspirational language for the future, then you're really left with strategic buyers. Those are the guys you bump into at your industry association convention, right? Those are your either your suppliers or your customers, someone up and down the value chain or you're left with private equity. Right. Bob, no one's inventing new ways to exit your business. Or you can do what a lot of people will do, right? Which is, I'll give you a hint. Exactly. Exactly. Nothing. <laughs> Die at your desk, leave the mess for someone else to clean up. And I can tell you, business owners, you'll be remembered not fondly, but you'll be remembered. I mean, this is a, it's a real problem. So the, the, the do nothing approach, and trust me, I've, I've assisted families where there, the unexpected happens. It's not fun. It, it is uh, it's brutally uh, devastating on the next generation and those are the left behind, right? And uh, so, um, I think your message is extremely important for all of us to start planning ahead of time. Um, you had mentioned that, that you were buying stock in your family's business. You weren't an employee. So the, the, your second question or third question is, uh, I think it's, um, would, you, would you like to buy stock or would you like to sell stock? And uh, without even asking those questions out loud or hearing the answers, we have all of these assumptions built up in our heads saying, you know, I think this person would like to be a partnership in part of the partnership on my accounting practice. I don't really know that really, do I? And, and same with any business owner. Um, yeah. Yeah, there, there is a lot of assumption making going on. So, I mean, parents looking at their kids who are, you know, working super hard, they seem passionate, 
And yet, if they ask them whether or not they wanted to go to a bank and borrow money and buy the business, they're going to find out that, that the kids, they like their job. They don't like the business enough. They don't share that passion that the founder has. The founder gave birth to this thing and just assumes that everyone's going to love it as much as they do. There can only ever be one founder of a business. Everyone who comes along afterwards is playing kind of like a second string, right? It's, it's hard for founders to imagine that. And that's where I come along with this book. And I think, Bob, this is why it's sold so many copies is because, because I come along and I say, business owner, your business is not your legacy. No, hey, let me ask you a question. I'll ask everyone the question. Who is the founder of Coca-Cola? When, I, when I'm speaking in front of 5,000 people, 500 people, I ask that question. You know what I hear in the audience? Crickets. Nothing. No one knows. That's the third most valuable consumer brand in the world. No one knows and no one cares who the founder was. Now, let's talk about the local... I don't know, maybe a guy's got a, 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 a number of auto dealerships or a funeral home. Like, seriously, no one is going to remember you for your business. So then, so then the, the business owner audience looks a little crestfallen. And then I say, if it's not your business that offers itself as a legacy, what is? And here's what I know in my heart and in my gut and in my brain. It's our family. Bob, it's our family. And when we can create liquidity and, and, and set our family off in, on, a, on, on journeys that are unique and authentic to them, these are the greatest gifts. How we leave our wealth is as important as what we leave. And that is a really the big message I'm trying to share. Once again, Tom, I, I'm going to invite my panelists to uh, ask a question or two in a second here. But uh, just, just to reiterate, though, um, I started off by saying just because we're referring to family all the time, this is not just direct family of a business. These are key employees in your business. All of these concepts do apply to all of your key employees that are become, gonna become stockholders in your business. And that's one of the exit ways to think about uh, helping them and create that liquidity for them as well. So, um, Trevor or Richard, I, I think you had a comment and I thought I'd invite you to uh, ask your question. Thanks, Bob. Sorry, Richard, I jumped in there first. Um, thanks again, Tom. This has been great so far. We really appreciate it. A question came in actually that I wanted to share uh, from one of our attendees to you, Tom, was, uh, you know, and it's buying at fair market value only works if the owners actually know that they need to back out and, and not still treat minor shareholders or their children uh, like they were before. Um, you know, you talked about the fact that bringing in the next generation can really bring this new energy, but how do you keep the, the previous owners, the founders from, I guess, dampening that energy a little bit? Well, listen, one thing I learned very early on, Trevor, it's a great question. I learned very early on in my, um, experience just with the transition of my father's business, that business is about control. It's not kinda about control. It is all about control. And you either have it or you don't. And so while I was buying shares in my father's business, he was constantly reminding me that, and it is one of the other questions, that he could still accept other unsolicited offers or solicited offers. In other words, the business was always for sale, even though I was buying it. And that little provision in our culture was, uh, was really keeping my feet to the fire. It was really forcing me to accelerate my purchase and drive to definitive 51% control. And my father was teaching me that once I bought my first series of shares, he issued a dividend. So then I took that dividend and I leveraged that. I, I, I got some bank financing and some family money and I bought more shares. Well, guess what? Two years later, my dividend was even bigger. And I took that bigger dividend and I did the same thing. And I did it again and again and again. And it's actually, you can actually accelerate to 51% quite quickly, exponentially. 
And I didn't trip over that idea in the forest by myself. My father taught that to me, right? We can teach, key, we can teach key employees the same thing. Um, COVID pricing right now may, may make a lot of shares very affordable. Absolutely. What a great way to start. What a great way to get people used to the idea of, uh, of just starting the purchase. I mean, there's an old saying, right? You can, eat a, you can eat a cow one burger at a time. If someone said, buy that business for $8 million, people go, I can't come up with $8 million. Start. Start. Buy one share. Buy. Use dividends. You know, get used to the idea of being an owner. You know, with risk capital. I mean, really test whether or not ownership is your thing. It's not for everyone. It's hard. It's meant to be hard. Right. right. Uh, Richard, um, do you have a, a question for Tom? Yes, I do. Tom, I've got a question about whether there should be multiple meetings. So what I'm getting at here is perhaps we have a family meeting to discuss uh, maybe the family's wealth and, and how that can transition from generation to generation. And then you talk about a business meeting for the family business. Is there also a separate meeting for directors of the business? Do you, do you suggest multiple meetings or are these all really one big meeting? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're talking about uh, an internal sale to a family member, then you could do what I've described inside the family meeting. If you're looking at key employees, uh, I really, I really encourage those 12 questions in the book that your uh, your listeners will be receiving. That those are great questions one on one with uh, with the key employees, right? Because really, what you're wanting to do is to use competition to raise the price. This is, this, listen, the job of the controlling shareholder, whether we're selling to family or to key employees, the job of the controlling shareholder is to get the most money. It's, it's the shortcuts and the discounting of shares that actually creates economic incentives in getting the wrong people to buy your business, which actually can imperil the whole deal. It's actually about one-on-one -on -one meetings to find out if you've got multiple buyers in the business. And if you do, that's fantastic. Because when you have multiple bidders, whether they're inside or outside your business, what do you suppose happens to the sale price? Oh yeah, up it goes. Listen, business owners, this is, I'm gonna guess, because it is for the vast majority of business owners, your largest asset, right? You made money. You didn't pull that profit out in the first couple of years and buy a Porsche, what'd you do? You did what we did, my father, grandfather, great grandfather. We make profits, we put it back in. We put it back in, we put it back in, we put it back in. We fund our own receivables, we fund our own capital expansions, our own, our own everything. Why? Because we hate leverage on our balance sheet. Why do we hate that? Because we don't want people telling us how to run our beautiful business. That's why we're in business. Because we're chasing something that is more intoxicating than money. What is it? Control. Control equals freedom, right? And then I come along and say, now you have to let go of control. Do you see how hard this subject is? What I'm describing is not easy, but taking a business with your nails dug into it right to your grave is just not, it's not gonna serve you or your family or your key employees, or anyone. So it is super, super hard to do what I'm describing, which is to let go. And really, if you have nothing that is more compelling and aspirational than running your business, here's what I know. Here's what I know for certain. You probably won't go. If you don't have something, whether it's teaching an MBA course, mentoring other entrepreneurs, uh, charitable work, board work, learning the violin, becoming a gardener, I, it doesn't matter. Something, if there is nothing that gets you excited, then you probably will never leave. And you will drive your key employees and your family crazy. So the sooner you start building those other interests in your life, um, truly many of us though, Tom, we love business. So, but it doesn't mean we have to run the same business. How many businesses have you been part of, Tom? Oh, uh, at least eight. I've probably got another eight left in me. Perfect, because I thought of a book that you and I should write, which we tripped onto our last conversation. 
Yeah, I know which one. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think the love of the love of business uh, that will never leave an entrepreneur. And whether and whether uh, we sell whatever it is, go ahead. Sorry. And nor should it. I mean, just because you sell your business, I know lots of business owners who sell and then they stay in in a in a consulting capacity. Uh, they become honorary chairman. They become the institutional memory. They become mentors, coaches. They become, they do the best part of the work without any of the financial stress because they've monetized their life work. Uh, this is a big problem, particularly in the farming community. A lot of farmers go, I'm not going to sell the farm to my, to my kids because then I'll have nothing to do. And then often you have the next generation going, what are you talking about? You can still rip rows on the tractor. In fact, we would love it if you do that. Like, do you see how they conflate? Owners conflate employment income with ownership, work with ownership, just like the kids do the same thing. What I'm saying is, listen, you can sell and still be relevant. Explore that conversation with your key employees and your family. And Tom, have you run into situations where the key employees, well, let's say that might be family members, that they they drive for the for these meetings that we're talking about but very often the owners won't. And have you had experience in helping that next gen um, facilitate those kinds of meetings so that we get we get this thing going? Any comments about how to do that best? Yeah, I, I think, listen, if a key employee ever came to um, me or certainly a founder and said, uh, listen, I'd love to have a conversation with you, and I would just ask that it be confidential, kept confidential between uh, myself and you, uh, founder. Uh, listen, I, I can see that obviously you are going to, you're getting older, and you will have to decide what to do with this business. And I just want to let you know that that I want to help participate either in that transition. I might want to buy it, or I want to help you sell this business to a third party. I want you to know that you can count on me because I know that a, a business owner cannot sell a business without the support and, and, and understanding and knowledge and participation of the key employees. Business owners cannot sell a business without the assistance and participation of their key employees. I hope people hear that. So when a business owner can trigger that conversation or the key employee can start that conversation, either way, there, there, is, there is a deeper, trusting, more respectful management team. And when business owners can put in place employment contracts with a clause that deals specifically with the sale of a business and, and has a loyalty clause that pays key employees to stay, not bolt for the door when someone buys the business, but to stay and to transition that business into the hands of new owners, guess what happens? When that business owner goes to sell the business and they meet with an interested buyer and there's two or three vice presidents are in the room, guess what? That business is going to sell for more because there are no secrets. There's alignment. There's understanding. There's planning. That's, that's right. smart. That's just smart. Right. Tom, I, I'm mindful of our time. I, I want to make sure that we close off. Um, uh, one of the questions that I've got is the, the what do you wish every participant would do when they sign off of this webinar? What are the, do you have two or three things that every single person that's watching should be doing? Yeah, the first thing would be to reach out and get a copy of the book. It is a super easy read. This is not a technical book on business transition planning or exit planning. In fact, it is a story of two people on a plane drinking scotch on their way to Barbados. And it's a chance encounter of an old guy sitting down beside a young guy and they spend the whole flight talking about what they did well and what they did wrong. Um, and so read the book. Secondly, sit down and have a conversation with your, with your, with your spouse. Sit down and have a conversation with your family members, ask them to read the book and try to tackle one or two or three or four of the questions. See how they respond to the questions. The book is completely useless. It has no answers, but it does have 12 fantastic questions that are guaranteed to start the most fascinating conversation 
between a business owner and their family or key employees. Absolutely fascinating. And then three, the last thing, make sure you attend the next webinar. Make sure that you ask for a copy of the recording of this webinar and share it with your family members. Share it with a couple of other business owners who are in your network or in your Rotary Club or wherever you, you meet and, and, and trust other business owners. I guarantee that they are struggling with this issue as well. Share it with um, customers. Share it with suppliers. There, there isn't a business owner right now up and down their supply chain that got family business owners. Nine out of 10 firms in Canada are family owned and controlled, they're everywhere. If you're a business owner, you're listening to this webinar, you are dealing with family owned businesses, their suppliers and their customers. Share the link, share the link with them. Uh, really, it's a, you've heard no mention of any product or any tax strategy. This is education. This is a gift that I know you're giving to your clients. It's not about product or services. Uh, Tom, we feel so strong that the message is so, so compelling. Uh, it's a must read for everybody in business. Uh, matter of fact, it's going to be a must read for each one of our team members here at HLH. And um, if you want a copy of the book, I encourage everybody that's watching, if you do not have a copy, please send me an email, send us a text, get a hold of us, and uh, we will get you a copy, a complimentary copy of the book. Uh, the 12 questions I think are just amazing and fantastic. Uh, I, I, I used one, the first question on, on a recent meeting and uh, to my surprise, the, the participants said, well, five years, man, this is gonna happen in two. So, you know, uh, and, and without even asking that question, I didn't know what the blueprint for that business was gonna be. That is another point, Tom, on, on our next conversation, perhaps we can talk about that blueprint piece and I know you talk about it in this book about creating the, the business blueprint and so that everybody understands what that blueprint looks like. You can't build a house without a blueprint and, and knowing exactly what you're driving for. So I, I do want to um, uh, remind everybody that we have two more seminars coming up. Uh, the next one is called Building Smart Estate Plans and that will be on November 26th at 2 p.m. We'll send you an invite on that one. Uh, we do have a final session with Tom uh, two weeks later, and that one's called the top six estate planning ideas that successful families master. So um, I think that's a, a good way perhaps to end this. Uh, I'd invite you and your family, friends, and business associates to join us. I love being challenged, and I know you do as well. So please uh, send your questions, and uh, we would love to help you uh, go forward. Um, I do, I think I have another another question here, but Tom, I, I, I'm just gonna give you the, maybe the last word here in a second. Uh, I do want to um, uh, thank Tom and my panelists and the production team here at HLH for making this webinar possible. Without all of you, obviously this, uh, this wouldn't, be, uh, wouldn't be a success as it is right now. So uh, once again, thank you for uh, all for being a participant. Um, I'm just gonna leave it, uh, Tom, uh, the last word is yours and uh, we'll just sign off from there. Yeah, I, first of all, I, I wanna thank you. Um, I think maybe there may be some people who listen who think that maybe all accountants uh, are the same. The reality is there's lots of accountants who would never have me on, who would never share this message, would never uh, invest in education. And, and I, so first of all, thank you. Um, secondly, let me just say to business owners, it, as much as this feels difficult and emotional, uh, there is nothing that will ever top the day where the purchasers of our business slid a check across the table and my father and I flipped over that check. We poured a glass of champagne. My father gave an incredibly gracious toast, wishing the new buyers of the business great success. And then I watched my 73 year old father run to the elevator to, to cash that check. I could barely keep up with them. It was such an exciting day. And what made it exciting is that we did it together. It was very much a collaboration. It wasn't my father got rich and I lost my job. It was very much a moment that we know that we worked on together and celebrated together and profited together. And it was an extraordinary moment. And I hope the listeners one day can share in something similar. 
Thank you, Tom. And uh, we look forward to helping all of our listeners uh, build their business, build their dreams, and uh, we can help with that planning process and we'll all move forward. So I look forward to everybody joining us again two weeks from now. Uh, we'll send everybody an invite and uh, Tom, we will talk to you two weeks from now. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Reverend. Thanks, Richard. Thank you.